Good morning, everyone. That was a professional start, wasn't it? <laughs> well, good morning, everybody, and, uh, and welcome to church. Uh, it is fabulous to have you with you. Um, yeah, so if you're at home and you're wondering what's going on, we don't know either. Um, but uh, can I also point out to those of you who are in the building, what have you done to offend all of these people because they've all moved over to the other side? This is shocking. Anyways, well, guys, it's, it is wonderful to have you with us. Um, and uh, we, because at the moment, especially with, uh, with the guidelines uh, changing constantly, we have decided to go for those who, are, who can and feel that they, uh, they're able to, to wear masks in church. So we appreciate you doing that. Um, I'm absolutely full of cold. So uh, you're going to have to, you're gonna, I know, oh, come on, a bit more sympathy would be lovely. Um, but you're going to have to deal with, uh, with listening to this husky voice for the entire service. Anyways, so I've just got a few announcements. Um, Nick, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, there's, there's a lot. Um, but most of it is written on um, the notice sheets uh, and will be emailed out to those of you who get it electronically. There's a couple that aren't on there uh, which are worth noting. But um, starting with, um, so tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon at 430 um, is our Messy Church Advent, um, so just a lot of fun for all the family, um, come along, get messy, do activities and then um, have a meal together, it's absolutely wonderful, so that's 4.30 tomorrow. Um, next thing that's worth noting as well is that um, our kitchen is still not quite ready yet if you've actually popped your head in um, and so what we've actually done is we've decided to postpone all the coffee shop side of things. Uh, until uh, next Monday, okay? So uh, we're just to give ourselves a little bit of cun uh, cushion space. They've told us it should be ready by Thursday, but uh, yeah, who knows? Uh, the beauty of having a really uh, decent but old building that's actually not had a lot of heating is when you then try and plaster a wall, there's just nothing to allow it to dry. So it's taken us a lot longer to be able to dry the plaster on the walls. So that's uh, just that. Can I just say as well, um, there's been a, a team of people behind the scenes who have been uh, painting and decorating the coffee shop uh, and doing a whole load of stuff. And for those of you who were involved in that, you know who you are. We just want to say a huge big thank you. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, some people mysteriously came down and decorated the church for Christmas as well. So those of you who came down for that as well, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, I need to do this one. Yes, next Sunday, next Sunday is our toy service. Now, um, toy service is Birmingham City Mission, um, and they've got this fantastic thing where they basically go around and, and give toys to kids who are less fortunate, who probably actually wouldn't get um, presents or anything uh, at Christmas. Uh, and so uh, we just want to just let you know that that's, that's something that we, we think is fabulous, we really want to get behind. So if you want, uh, please do uh, feel free to bring uh, a present for a child. Um, and uh, if you want some more information about maybe what to buy, for example, uh, if you go on to Birmingham City Missions uh, website, uh, there's um, things that they need. But also at the same time that there is an, uh, there's the Amazon wish list. So you can literally click on it. Um, and for those of you that do shopping online, it allows you to be able to buy a present through their site that will get delivered to them by Amazon. So it takes you out of it, but you still have the joy of being able to buy that present for those children. So uh, just that's, that's this coming Sunday. So if that's you, then fabulous. The next uh, date to be aware of is the 18th of December. There's a lot going on on the 18th of December. Um, the coffee shop will be open as normal from nine o'clock. And then we do have a Christmas fair, which is starting from at 12 o'clock until 3 o'clock. We've got stalls, we've got games, we've got things being sold, we've got food, we've got all, it's all going on. It's going to be amazing. Um, so please do come along to that. If you can volunteer, we do need as many helpers as we can get. There's going to be, like I say, a lot going on, a lot of stalls to be, um, that will need to be manned and just, yeah, if you can uh, give up a couple of hours on that Saturday, um, let me know and I will, yeah, we'll, we'll sort it out. I'm, I'm, I'm just in the middle of organising everything at the moment, so uh, with my lovely little team, um, we are working really hard, so um, it will be awesome, but yes, if you can give a couple of hours, that'd be fab. And then at four o'clock, um, we have our Christmas concert um, and this is going to be just a number of groups who use our building. Um, um, it won't be a really long concert, but it's going to be musical. It's going to be 
Um, there were some gymnastic -y things going on yesterday, which looked really fab. So, um, yes, that is a ticketed event. Um, tickets are £3, and we do have tickets now. Um, if you would like to buy some, I've got some. Come see me or Crystal. And, um, yes, we can arrange that for you. So that is going to be a very busy day, but it's going to be wonderful and Christmassy. So that's the Saturday. The following Sunday um, is the 19th, and that is our Chris Dingle service. Um, and it's a messy church one, so this is, it's chaos, but it's beautiful. Um, and, uh, and if you've never done a Chris Dingle, uh, Chris Dingle essentially is where you decorate an orange, and it's very symbolic, and then you light the candle on top of the orange, and we sing a song, and it's, but it's beautiful. And again, it's just another one of those things around Christmas that's quite a highlight. Um, so that takes us to that. Uh, there will be lunch on that day as well, um, just to note, don't put uh, anything in the oven on that morning. Um, and then, so then we have um, one that's not on the notice sheet, so we're going to do um, like a really nice laid back um, carol service in our coffee shop um, and we're just going to have it really low lit, we're going to have the coffee machine go in, we're going to get some mince pies and um, Phil's going to lead in some carols and just come and sing along. That will be on Tuesday, the 21st of December at 6 o'clock. Thank you. I even made the poster and haven't forgotten it. Anyway, um, so that's Tuesday, the 21st, uh, in the coffee shop. And then we are going to have our carols by candlelight uh, in the church on, the, on Christmas Eve at 6.30. Fab. So, yeah, a couple of carol services to get involved in as well. If you've never done our carol service, um, it's, it's, it's much more of a, um, a traditional style carol service. And the beauty is it's at night time, which means you can light this place with candles. And we've got a whole load of uh, classical instruments leading us in our, in our carols, which is lovely. It's always very well attended, uh, so to, to make you aware of that one. Um, and then the last two things is, and then, then I, f I promise this is the end of our notices so much, but this is because it's December, uh, is that there will be a service on Christmas Day, and that's the Saturday. Uh, and we love our Christmas service. It's only about 45 minutes long. It's at 10.30. If we do it any earlier than that, it conflicts with kids and, and opening presents. If we do it any later than that, it gets in the way of the turkey. So we don't want that. So, uh, so yes, we do a 10.30 service, uh, and it's basically calm if you, in, and we encourage encourage as many of you, if you've got given a gift, as long as it's not really loud, right, please bring it. Even if you, even if, for those of you who maybe got given a pair of socks, wear them, you know, this is just fabulous. Uh, but because of all of this stuff going on, we've decided that because the following day is the Sunday, um, that actually we're not having a service on that Sunday. So, uh, so because of us doing so much coming up to it, we just thought actually it'll be nice to give you guys just a bit of a rest. So, uh, so that's, that basically takes you through, and then the next service will be the day after New Year's Day. So that's, that's the Christmas run-up. Um, most of this is actually on your new sheet, um, and uh, there will be lots going across our social media from here on. But uh, Christmas is, is so exciting, isn't it? Um, now, we, uh, we've struggled to be able to, we don't know where some of the boxes of our Christmas decorations have gone, so we've normally got a lot more light up, but we've also somehow managed to lose our, um, our Advent candles. And so for those, of, we've got two there, but um, I thank you for pointing at them, um, but that's not a full set, and we don't know where they are. Anyway, so we're, we're on the, on the th so if you come and it's Advent and you're like, Phil, why haven't you lit the candles? It's like, yeah, find them, that's why. Um, so uh, I'm just going to open up in prayer uh, and uh, just just to, to point out today is the second Sunday of Advent. I've just pretended to light two candles. There we go. We've done it. Um, and uh, let's let's take a moment just to pray, shall we? And then uh, Nick's going to lead us in a time of sung worship. Lord Jesus, I thank you for today. I thank you for this chance for us to be able to come here to be together. Lord, we thank you for. Lord, just the wonder of what is Christmas, and Lord, the mystery that, that still is so surrounded, that whole event, and Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that this gives us a chance to be able to focus on family. It gives us a chance to be able to focus on, on, on you, Lord, and we just ask God, would you just be in our midst today? Would you speak to hearts and minds in this place? Lord, draw us deeper into you. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Okay, we're gonna we're gonna start with two songs and then we're gonna take communion. So uh, we're gonna start with a song called "The Way." Um, if you wanna stand, and we will sing together.
Father, we are so grateful that we are your chosen children. And just singing that, in my Father's house, there's a place for me. That's so true, and we just want to worship you this morning, because we want to thank you for everything. Thank you that you died first. Thank you that we are your family, no matter what. And you love us, like we can't even imagine. It's a love like no other. And God, we ask that we will just feel your presence this morning, that you will speak to us through Phil, through this communion that we're about to take, and just let us not sit and just have some wine and some bread, but God, let us really think about the meaning behind that, about what you've done for us, and what that means, and the love that is in that. God, yeah, just we ask that you'll be with us this morning, we ask this in your name, amen. Oh man, guys, please do take your seats. So today is our communion service, and um, if you've arrived and haven't managed to pick up any bread and wine, can you just indicate by popping your hand up in the air, and we'll uh, we'll distribute some bread and wine to you guys. Um, if you've not got bread and wine and you'd like some for the communion, okay, not to worries. So. Um, we're, uh, we're moving into communion. We've decided to do this uh, as, uh, as part of our worship with our kids as well. Um, and so, uh, so if you've got um, your bread and wine, this is the time that you're going to need to be able to use it. 
For us as, as a church, we, we believe in something called the open table. Um, and that is that literally anybody is permitted to take communion. We believe that whether you're at that point where, you know, you've known Jesus for decades and, and, and you're walking a life with him, or whether you're still on the outside and you're still trying to work out, like, is this for me? We, we've, we've made a decision um, as a church to have something called an open table, which basically means we just want to invite you. Because one of the things that strikes me is if you read through Luke's gospel, uh, when I was at uh, the theology college, one of the things that one of my tutors mentioned just in passing was, do you know, I think, I think Jesus is either on his way from a meal or on his way to a meal pretty much all the way through the gospel of Luke. And actually, when you look at it, that's pretty accurate. Like, food seems to be at the center point of most of Jesus' sermons. I mean, how often does he refer to himself as being the bread of life? Uh, or he refers to himself as being the living waters. We're going to be looking at a little bit of that today in our sermon as we work our way through it. But like just this concept that, you know, that, that God's kind of welcoming us to join the feast. And, and so that's exactly what we're doing today. And, but what we're feasting on is literally just bread. And for some of you, it'll be wine. So for some of you, you've, you've picked up uh, grape juices. You've come through a uh, non-alcoholic version. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, read a section from what Paul gave us. And, uh, you know, so much of Christianity can be explained, right? And there was a huge movement a few decades back called apologetics, which is this concept of explaining so much of God and to try and make it, like, approachable to people. But I think in some of it, as much as I, and I, I'm really big on apologetics, but on some of it, we almost kind of like seem to try and explain away the mystery of it all. And, I, you know, of, of all the things for Jesus to sit down and to take some bread and to kind of make just a statement and say, this is my body. And then to pick up a cup of, of wine and then say, and this is my blood. There, there, there would have been a moment that the, that the people within that, that sitting would have, would have been quite disturbed by the language that he's using. And so, so as we use this language, even with our kids in our midst, there's a part of us that kind of just kind of twists as we talk about like the concept of eating flesh and drinking blood. It's weird. But you see, the thing is, it's supposed to be. It's supposed to kind of make us sit and go, what, what's this all about? And so as we today sit down and we realize that actually, to put it as simple as possible, it is this, that we cannot enter heaven without Jesus being our Lord and Savior, which means we cannot get into heaven if we are not part of this whole concept. Jesus has to be the center, otherwise it doesn't work. And that's the concept. So when we're eating um, and, and, and drinking this, we're kind of saying that actually I, I need you in my life. I need, I need you to be the, the, the reason for this. And so as we, as we take this concept of literally just looking at these two items here, the, the body and the blood, it's this a, a concept of saying, actually, Jesus, I need you. I need you in my life. Uh, and, and so that's essentially, that's what this is about. Now, if you're still there and you're kind of looking in and trying to work out, is this for you? I still want to just encourage you just to take communion with us today. But Paul gives us his instructions in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as he's explaining what he himself had learned. Now, Paul wasn't in the room when uh, the disciples all sat down. And so in the midst of this, if you were to read the, the, the chapter heading of this, it's instructions in public worship. We are trying to do this in a, a COVID secure way, which is one of the reasons why we've got the bread and wine and, and individual servings to try and kind of make it as possible as, uh, as we can. But this kind of instruction on how to be able to worship God. And Paul then takes this moment and says that this is how it was explained to him. So this is how he's then explaining it to us. In verse 23, it reads as follows. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself on the night that he was betrayed. I want you just to, just to allow those words to hit you. On the night that he was betrayed, which he was betrayed by his friends. And actually, I know for ourselves sitting here, so many of us, as much as we try to live the perfect life, we don't. As much as we try to get stuff right, we still make mistakes. I joke about it all the time saying, I don't, you don't need me to point at you and say, you've done this wrong today. We already know. So when this concept, when he says, on the night that he was betrayed, 
Actually, if we're honest, we've not done what we know that we should have done. We've not behaved. We've not said those things that we know that we should have said. There's times when we thought things that we know that we shouldn't have. And so just as his friends, two of which, Judas, who we knew was a little bit corrupt for quite a while, but Peter, his closest friend, betrayed him by saying that he didn't even know him later on that evening, right? That each of us here, if we're honest... We're Peter, we're Judas. We, we've done stuff that has caused us to, we're not where we should be with God. So this idea of on the night he was betrayed, we almost fit that. Yet he gave, he gave the bread and wine to Peter and Judas that evening, knowing their hearts, knowing the things that they would do later on that day. Jesus wasn't saying, you're not welcome. In fact, he still says, in spite of our failings, that we are welcome. And we need, to, we need to allow that just to hit us this morning. Wherever you're at, Jesus is saying, you are welcome. The Lord took some bread and he gave thanks for it. And then he broke it into pieces. And then he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let us together take the bread in remembrance of him. And let's eat together. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying this cup is the new covenant between God and his people an agreement confirmed with my blood do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it let us drink together for every time that you eat this bread and drink this cup you are announcing the lord's death until he comes again let's just take a moment just to pray shall we and just thank god for what we've done together heavenly father i, th I thank you lord for this moment that we've been able to share together knowing that around the world today so many other people are doing this and Lord, it feels weird as we're beginning to celebrate Christmas, the birth of Jesus. We're also celebrating you right now in the death of you. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that everything about Christmas is just the celebration that this marks the beginning of your plan in its fullness. And so, Lord, we just say, come meet us now, we say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, this is brilliant because this is actually our time for our young people to head on out. So we've got activities for you. So if you guys want to head your way out, and uh, I'm going to pray for you guys as you go. I'm also going to pray for us as well because, well, I don't know about you, but I would really like God to speak to me this morning uh, as much as we want God to speak to our wonderful children this morning. Nice Christmas jumper. I think yours looks better than mine though, mate. <laughs> I know why I ate the bread. I know. Right. Let's just pray for our children as they head out. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for our amazing kids. Lord, this is the church of today. And so, Lord, we just pray, would you speak to them, Lord? Would you do something wonderful in their midst? And Lord, as we, your children, today come to meet you, Lord, we ask, would you speak to us as well? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. We need to put these out, don't we? Right. So... Today, uh, I'm going to be uh, looking at a section of scripture. Sam, could you do me a favor? Can you just give me a hand and just move in the communion table just back a bit? I'm just going to push it back. So I need the space, unfortunately, because I'm going to be doing an illustration that I hope you might remember in years to come. Or not, either way. I'm always aware that sometimes I think some of the, the greatest sermons I preach, we forget within minutes. And the illustrations that, that were just a passing, passing thought the morning is the thing you seem to remember. So I want to tie the two together. See, 
if I'm honest, um, I've been preaching a sermon series for a little while now called The Jesus Is. We spent a lot of time looking at who is Jesus. I mean, we say that we worship Jesus. In all the songs, we're proclaiming what he's done. Uh, and there's so much about who Jesus is. But it's really easy, um, I think, just sometimes for us to kind of skip that. Um, and at the moment, I'm really aware that in our midst, we've got so many people who are literally on a faith journey. Some of you who have just joined the church just recently, this is all completely new. And some of us who have been believers for decades. And actually, if I'm honest, I think we just need to keep coming back to some of those bare essentials. And so we've chosen to do this whole sermon series just on actually... Who is Jesus? Why do we worship Jesus? Um, and, and actually, the, the idea of worshiping Jesus in the early century, uh, the beginning of the century when the church was born, was something that actually the people really struggled with because we were told to worship there is only one God, and then suddenly we're also worshiping Jesus. And so um, it, it was a journey that the early church went on as we began to understand that Jesus actually is God and began to look at that. So we spent quite a bit of time looking at that. Now then... This week, um, well, actually it was last week, uh, God woke me up um, with a, a particular word. Uh, and uh, and I, so I've chosen to completely depart from my sermon series for a little while, uh, at least just for today, uh, just to kind of explain this. Because um, it, it struck me and it's something that I just felt was not, not for me as an individual, but was for us as a church. We're going to take a look at a Bible verse that um, the guys are going to put onto the screen. This is um, from, uh, from Ezekiel. Uh, and in Ezekiel chapter 47, um, you might have actually been with us about three, nearly four years ago. I, I did a whole sermon series actually on the river of God. Um, and, uh, but just, it was this particular verse that just struck me. So we're just going uh, just gonna to read this. And then I'm going to explain a little bit about why this meant something to me. So... This is 12 verses. It says this. In my vision, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. Sorry, I just need to give some background detail to this. This is a bit random because we just started off with something. So Ezekiel uh, was a prophet in the Old Testament. um, And and God gave him a vision uh, of uh, of the temple of God. And this, this is what he's about to explain. And the man he keeps referencing is this angelic being. And in a couple of weeks back, we looked at the whole way that Jesus is throughout the Old Testament. A lot of the um, a lot of the um, Bible scholars believe that the person to whom was showing Ezekiel around is actually Jesus um, in in physical form. Granted, before he became Jesus, so uh, so that's just to give you just a bit of a where is Jesus? I think he's right here, actually, in this scripture that we're looking at. But anyway, so this is we've got the man, uh, and this is t- talking to Ezekiel. So there's your background details. Okay, now let's jump into this. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple and passing to the right of the altar on its south side. The man brought me outside the wall uh, through the north gateway and led me around the eastern entrance where I could see the water flowing out through the south side of the east gateway. Measuring as he went, he took me along uh, the stream for 1,750 feet uh, and then led me across. The water was up to my ankles. He measured off another 1,750 feet and led me across again. This time, the water was up to my knees. After another 1,750 feet, it was up to my waist. Then he measured another 1,750 feet, and the river was up. Uh, It was too deep to walk across. It was deep enough to swim in, but too deep to walk through. He asked me, Have you been watching, son of man? Then he led me back along the riverbank. When I returned, I was surprised to see the sight of so many trees growing on both sides of the river. Then he said to me, this river flows east through the desert and into the valley of the Dead Sea. The waters of this stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. There will be swarms of living things wherever the water of the liver of the river, try again, wherever the water of this river flows, fish will be, fish will, 
abound, come on Phil, in the Dead Sea, for his waters will become fresh. Life will flourish wherever this river flows. Fishermen will stand along the shores of the Dead Sea, all the way from the En Gedi to the En Glam. The shores will be covered with nets, drying in the sun. Fish of every kind will fill the Dead Sea, just as they fill the Mediterranean. But the marshes and swamps will not be purified, and they will still be salty. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both sides of the river. The leaves of these trees will never turn brown or fall, and there will always be fruit on their branches. There will be a new crop every month, for they are watered by the river flowing from the temple. The fruit will be food and the leaves for the healing. Okay, this is quite a picture, isn't it? And at the beginning, as he's explaining about the temple, you've got to remember that as he's explaining this, the, this is the Jewish people, they knew what their own temple looked like. So that is, is an explanation to us. Unfortunately, that temple is well and truly destroyed. It was done uh, just after Jesus had, uh, had, had, had died. We're talking about AD 80-ish um, was when the temple itself was destroyed. Uh, and the Romans did it because there was a big insurrection that happened and the, the, the Jewish people tried to fight back. And so Rome decided once and for all to squash the temple and in doing so uh, knew that if, he, if it blotted out the temple that the Jewish faith would suffer. And it did. Um, so we haven't got a temple to be able to use as an illustration. So, But when he's explaining this, it makes sense. So I just want to kind of put this just into some sort of a picture form for you. And I'll just remind you of a, of a, of a talk that we did a little while back. And then I'm going to explain to you what God's been speaking to me about. So the first thing is, uh, he's explaining that in the temple, this stream just miraculously is just bubbling up, almost like a spring. And then it goes past the altar and something wonderful happens as it works its way out through the temple. And then as it reaches the other side of the temple, it's just constantly every 1,750 feet, as he says it so many times, uh, that it's just getting bigger and bigger. So it starts off, and as he walks across it, it's literally at his ankles. And then another 1,750 feet, it's then up to his knees, then it's up to his waist, and then he can't cross without having to swim because it is so deep. So again, so this is it, that, that shouldn't happen in such a short space of time. I don't know if you've ever been out to the countryside and you've seen streams. Streams stay streams for a long time before they become rivers. Yet 1,750 feet is not much. So again, there's something... There's something miraculous that's happening in this is ex explaining it. Then something else happens. Now, again, this is lost to us. Unless you know anything about um, Israel as it currently stands, there is a, a sea called the Dead Sea, which there is streams walking, going into the Dead Sea, but there's nothing coming out of it because the area around it is so hot that actually it's just constantly, it's drying up before it has chance to be able to leave that sea. So it's just essentially, it's a huge big lake that is utterly, um, <clears throat> it's called dead because its salt um, level is so high that you can actually lay on the surface of the Dead Sea. Uh, it's now most famous as a spa, bizarrely enough, because uh, the soil is so rich of nutrients. People like to go and bathe in the Dead Sea, cover their faces in it, and because actually it's good for the skin because of its high salt and its nutrients. Now, that's nothing to do with this. But, but what's worth noting is that it's dead. That's the point. And there is, there's already streams that go into it. Yet in this vision, as Ezekiel is explaining, he says, when this river hits the Dead Sea, something dramatic happens, and it's purified. And as it's purified, it continues to bloom and go on. And then he begins to explain about that the water is so full of just fish of every type. And he uses the illustration of like the Mediterranean Sea. Now, don't know about any of you guys... Um, uh, has, has anybody ever been snorkeling? Oh, you're an adventurous town. Oh, 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 hey, we've got a 50-50. We've got people on this side that have. Okay. Um, anybody been scuba diving, just out of curiosity? We've got a nod. We've got another nod. Yes, I love this. This is great. Um, so um, if you've ever been in, like, it, we, we, on our honeymoon, we went to Thailand, and uh, we went snorkeling uh, along a, a coral reef, and just... The fish we saw was just tremendous, and we were only in a tiny little bit, you know, and, and just the sheer quantity of different types of fish in the sea is huge. 
And the Mediterranean is renowned for its just different fish. It's, it's beautiful. And he's likening the, f- the types of fish and the multiple different types of fish in the Dead Sea, which is we know is impossible because nothing can live in it, but because the river of God, and this is the thing that he's pointing out, the spirit of God hits that that is dead and life comes to it. Okay? And as we began to explore this as a church a couple of years back, we were just saying that we believed that God was saying the same thing about us as Four Oaks Baptist Church, that God's got something incredible in store for the area around that if we would focus our hearts and minds on who God is, that actually that from this place would be life. And that just in the same way as Ezekiel is explaining about the wonder from the temple, so it's the same concept. And we're saying that if we choose to focus on God, if we choose to put him first and to live for him as individuals, but as as a church, there's something amazing, something miraculous will happen in this community as areas that that are renowned almost as being being dead or peoples, uh, if you start to think about it, as, as, as individuals, we know that there are people uh, within our families who are so dead set against God. We know that there are, there's, there's so much of the, of the culture around us that is so dead set against God. But it's this idea that actually if we be a church that is obedient to him, that we will begin to see life leaving this place and transforming the lives of the houses around us, the lives of our own people within our own households, that if we begin to do this, this river of God begins to bring life, that that is dead, suddenly comes to life. And that was a really quite a dramatic moment for us, kind of as a church. And this was pre, I think, if I'm right in saying, before we launched the coffee shop. Um, and it was just kind of like this sense that actually we've got this, we, we genuinely believe as a church that God's got something huge in store for us. And so this is this, the sermon series that we looked at um, a little while back. Unfortunately, I don't think it was recorded, so you just have to take my word for it. But that was it. Um, but that's the kind of, that's, that's where uh, something we've already began to kind of look at. So, when God woke me up, this is what happened. Um, I was just looking at my own life and I was just, I was just in that moment between sleep and awake. Uh, and I just, and I just had this one of these moments and I was just like, Lord, you know, there's been times in my life where I've really seen you move. And then there's been times when actually I'm just quite happy treading water. Uh, and I said, but Lord, I just, I just want more of you. And that was what I thought as I began to fall asleep. And then I just got this overwhelming sense that, that God was just saying essentially the following. And that was this. Phil, there's been times in your life where you've seen me move. And that's because you've, you've had to throw yourself in. You've had to trust me. And the times when actually life's okay, you have a tendency just to be happy where you are and not look for me. But. I've got so much more in store. And then he began to talk about us as a church. And it was this kind of sense that that God's actually calling us deeper into him. And using the the analogy of the stream, and I had to remind myself of the sermon that we we did because it was the the stream concept that that is a river. I got this sense that that God was saying, Phil, there's, there's, there's many of us as a church that are, we get the idea of the river of God. And actually, if you want to take part in who God is, you've got to get in. And that actually, there's so many of us who are standing on the riverbank, who are looking in. And I just felt God was saying, you know, yes, looking at God from a distance, looking at Christianity, looking at church is, is great. And it's beautiful. And there's elements of this that you're looking at that feels beautiful. But until you take the step, that actually, you're not going to know it. I felt that God was saying, Phil, there's loads of people who have been Christians for years who are having a wonderful time dabbling their toes in the water. You've maybe been to church for years um, and yet not quite actually gone that much further. Maybe this faith is a faith of your, your parents. Maybe this is a faith of, of something that you've been in and around and you've enjoyed church, but it's always been, I don't know, maybe a bit of a social club or something along those lines and that you've accepted Jesus in principle, but actually you've not really jumped into who he is. There's others that, that I got, God was kind of saying that actually, guys, you've been Christians for years and you are loving that splash play, you know, and those moments where actually you've, you've been involved in church and there's been times where it's been great um, and it's been, been fun and the concept of who God is. And, 
working in and through you. Maybe in times of worship, you've experienced it. Maybe there's been moments where, where you've gone to conferences or, or maybe just in your prayer life that it's been wonderful. Um, but again, it, it's still like it happened, but it's not happening at the moment. It's that kind of like I'm in, but I'm not fully in. Um, but then I got this kind of sense that actually God's saying, but as much as you think this is fun, uh, and it is, Actually, if you would look under the surface of the water, you would see that there is so much more. Um, and, and it was this, and it, this is where it started to go a, a, a little bit um, kind of off on one, which was this idea that actually, I don't know if you've ever looked at water, that actually, if you're looking down on it, directly down on it, you can actually see under. But if you look at water from an angle, you actually get a reflection, don't you? which is often why we think the, the, the sea looks a certain color. And it's most of that is the reflection of what's on top. That's why when you go up to Yorkshire and you go to the North Sea, it's always cloudy up there. It's the grayest sea you've ever seen. Um, but yet, yeah, you go to areas like Cornwall and the sea's crystal clear and, it's, and it, you'd say it was blue. Um, and, and so this idea that actually I think that a lot of us, as much as we're, we're looking at who God is, what we're seeing actually isn't the fullness of the adventure that he's wanting to call you to. You're still seeing a lot of the world around, that you're still seeing lots of stuff that's maybe not necessarily um, what God's wanting you to see. And it actually takes an intentional look. And it's this idea that I'm actually going to say, God, I'm going to choose to, to, to go deeper, to, to go, to look, to see, to experience. Um, and, uh, and so, so th this is where I needed some space because I'm just going to show you some bits and pieces. So the first thing is, and this is where Phil's mind goes great. So I believe that God, God gives us everything that we need to be able to experience God in its fullness. And so, first of all, like if we're going to choose to fully experience God, we need to know that God actually clothes us with what we need, right? You're not going to go into who God is and you're suddenly going to feel yourself utterly overwhelmed, right? That actually, as we begin to choose to kind of throw ourselves into who God is and we begin to move, listen, um, God's going to clothe you correctly. And so to help me with that, I've brought, this is my dry suit because I do scuba dive. So here's my dry suit. Now, the wonder of a dry suit is that I can actually wear whatever I want underneath it, right? So when I'm going, when I'm actually going scuba diving, because I've been doing it in England and not actually uh, in, uh, in in nice Mediterranean heat, it's cold, right? Especially where I've been doing it is. So the wonder of this actually allows you to be able to wear like a decent tracksuit underneath it and still stay warm. But this is the point of, a, of, a, of essentially a dry suit or a wetsuit is just for that, is, is that it does two things. The first thing is that it does, is it protects you. Um, and it protects you should you catch yourself on something that's sharp underneath the water. But also it keeps you warm. So it's a protection on two levels. And, and I need you to understand that actually when we invite Jesus into our lives properly, when we kind of say, actually, God, you know, I, 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 want, I want you in my life. And it's, it's that huge step. It, it's a twofold thing. Yeah, we're inviting Jesus in, but actually he begins to clothe us in his righteousness. I just love that. And that terminology works so well because actually it, we're not made righteous by anything we do. We're made righteous by who he is and what he's done for us. And, and actually as we begin to kind of like understand this, that actually he wishes to clothe us. And so I've chosen to bring this to show you this. Next thing is, there's no point going uh, diving if you cannot see. So this is a mask. Now, I'd said to Nick she was going to help me put it all on. Now then that would be a sermon you'd never forget, right? But one, it would take me far too long. You don't want to watch that. It's very cumbersome. Um, and second thing is I'm so full of cold, I really can't be bothered. Um, so you just have to pretend that I'm wearing this. Anyway, so this is, this is a goggle. Uh, um, this is essentially your mask that allows you to be able to see. Because, do you know what? When we become Christians, and I, I said this last week, this idea that actually when we become a Christian, life looks different. And it actually does. And I used to say this to teenagers as a youth worker. It was like, you know, you come to me and say, hey, listen, I want to become a Christian. And I'm like, are you really sure? Are you sure? 
Because if you do, those parties aren't going to feel the same. When you're watching all of your friends getting up to the stuff that you've got up to in the past, you're going to feel really awkward inside. Why? Because you know it's not right. But at the same time, you start to see God move in your life in ways which you'd never imagine. And the amount of times that like, we have a tendency, and I genuinely believe this, we have a tendency to miss the blessings of God because we're not looking. You know, we've been talking about like, our fabulous heaters, which do such a great job. The kitchen that's being put in at the moment. All of these various different stuff happened because, because God did something wonderful. We, yes, we applied to be able to get some funding. We never for one moment imagined that we would get the level of funding that we got from the government. Now, now it's not, it, sorry, from the government, from, uh, it was a certain charities. But it, it's that kind of like, we, we never imagined for one moment that we would get that. And, and yeah, we could just put it down to, it was coincidence, right? Or alternatively, it does feel like God's blessing us. And I think that actually when we begin to choose to become a Christian, if we actually get to see stuff in new and wonderful ways, and equally with that, that there's, there's, there's an element that actually, there's no point going scuba diving if you can't see. The whole purpose is that, that the wonder of actually seeing what's going on underneath to see the fish, to be able to dive into the wrecks. That's one of my favorite things is to, to actually dive into um, something that's submersed and actually the, there's uh, a particular place I go which is, has got a, 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 an aeroplane that's been sunk and you can actually swim straight through. I mean, you can sit on the toilet if you really wanted to as well. I have done that. Uh, but you can also go into the cockpit as well and actually peer out. And this, but th- all of this is happening underneath the surface. And, and actually when you arrive, like it's just... It's just a sea or it's just a lake or it's just a quarry, wherever it is that you're going. But the beauty is, is underneath it and the fish is amazing. So that brought that. Now again, these, these are flippers. Because at the end of the day, if you can't swim, you're, you're either just going to float or you're just going to stay where you are. And I get the sense that actually God's saying that, that actually the adventure begins when we start doing it. You know, scuba diving does require you to be relatively fit to a, de- to do a degree anyway because you're expected to do the paddling yourself. You're not going to be dragged along. It's not passive. And I think that that speaks to us so much as believers is that actually I think many of us just seem to think that actually God's going to do it all. I've become a Christian and life's going to be great. But actually the reality is it requires us to do the work. It requires us actually to get ourselves active and to begin to do stuff. And actually as we do, it becomes more fun because the adventure is like, oh, what's around here? And so the, 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 the beauty of the adventure comes with this also. Now what else have I got in my bag? I've got some gloves. That's an obvious one, isn't it, really? Um, protect your hands. Now then... Up to this point, you're just looking, aren't you? But you need to be able to breathe. So, hold on. Oh, so this is my oxygen tank. And it has actually got oxygen in it. There you go, proof. Because at the end of the day, you need to be able to breathe underwater. Because otherwise you're just snorkeling. And snorkeling is fun, don't get me wrong. But there's so much happening down there and I want to see it. And I would say that that's actually where many of us are at the moment, is maybe like, maybe you're suited, maybe you're booted, maybe you're all there, you're ready, but there's stuff happening down there and you need to see it. And I, that requires you to take off the snorkel and replace it with your breathing apparatus to be able to go down. And this I liken mostly to the wonder of the Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit of God in us, right? And, and it's, I think it's one thing to kind of say, yes, listen, I'm a, I'm a believer, I get it, I love all of it, and to understand the theology aspect of it. But guys, we've got to be in a place where we are filled with the Spirit. And that, I think if I'm honest, from what I read, from what I understand, is something that isn't a one-off thing. This is about saying, God, would you fill me with your Spirit constantly, when you're feeling just dry, when you're feeling that actually you're on your own, when you're feeling that actually life's difficult, it's one of those, Lord, would you just fill me with your spirit again? And it's that sense of breathing in his spirit. And actually, the the deeper down you go, the breathing underwater is a surreal thing. 
But I also want to explain this to you. There's something about buoyancy in the water. There's a technique uh, when you're scuba diving that actually uses your lungs to decide whether you're coming up or whether you're going down. And that works. But if I inflate my lungs to full capacity, then I'm a bag of air. Does that make sense? And what does air do? Underwater, it goes up, doesn't it? So if I learn to fully breathe in, use all of my lungs, and then shallow breathe, then I'm going to come up gently whilst I'm swimming. Without me angling myself, without me pointing myself upwards, just by breathing. Equally, if I breathe out and then shallow breathe with empty lungs, so I'm still, my body's getting the oxygen that it needs, but I'm now no longer, then I'll begin to descend gradually because of how I'm breathing. Isn't that awesome? Yeah? It takes a while to get used to, but that's awesome. And so now I would say that actually this is something that we need to grasp as well. Now then, the last thing is this, and this is the bit I don't like, <coughs> and that is all of these. Does anyone know what these are? Weights. Yeah, these aren't the ones you do curls with to get nice tidy biceps. These thread through your belt. Uh, they go in your BCU, your, uh, your like a, a life jacket that you wear. And the reason that you end up wearing all of these weights are the more neoprene you put on, the more plastic, the more rubber, more all of these other things, you become more and more buoyant. And some of us are more buoyant than others. I, I'm definitely aware I'm a little bit more buoyant than I was this time before lockdown. I've quite enjoyed eating my way through lockdown. I don't know about anybody else, but... But we actually require weights, and the weights themselves are what actually brings it down. You want, when you're actually in the water, um, and you've actually got all of your stuff on, you're trying to, and, and depending on how much more you've eaten this month than last month, you might need one extra weight, which is always depressing. <laughs> you put on the same amount as last month, and I'm still floating. I just can't get under the water. I feel you need to put another weight on. Now, the weights themselves, right? When I was... When, I was, when God was giving me the picture of this, I was like, Lord, I don't like the weights. And I just got, God was saying this, that actually the weights, the weights are the times in our lives, you know, when stuff doesn't go right. When stuff's difficult. When you've got stuff that goes wrong, or when the amount of times that, like, you hit financial difficulties or somebody in your family's ill or you're ill or, you know, life falls apart. It's in those moments that actually we throw ourselves into God because there's nowhere else to go. And that's what God wants us to do. And I think that actually over time, because of those moments of hardships and those weights, that actually those become things that actually help define us, not because of the bad that's gone wrong, but because of how we met God in those downs. Now, I've often talked about this, but um, I went through uh, a divorce a long time before meeting Nikki. And, uh, and I remember that at that point, that was really difficult for me as an individual because actually everything I was accustomed to, everything I was used to, life, ministry, friends. I think it was really interesting how some friends really stuck with me and some friends found it so awkward, actually, they just departed. Some friends felt they had to choose sides. It was really awkward. But with that, actually, that was a really difficult time. But in that moment, I had nowhere else to turn. And it was in those moments that I had some utterly incredible moments with God because I chose to make him my everything. And now when I look at my faith, in those dark valleys is where God cultivated something amazing in my own faith journey. So I think sometimes we look at those hardships, and, you know, and I'm not saying that actually God's saying that, that those hardships are, um, are something that, uh, that God's particularly taking you through, but it's how we weather those. Because whether you're a Christian or not, I talked about this last week, this is something that's one of those horrible statistics, but one in two people, if you live your life to its fullness, will get cancer at some point. That's a statistic according to uh, um, the British Cancer Foundation. Mm -hmm. I was reading that. But yeah, um, and in fact, it's just one of those ones that strikes me. So let's face it, whether you're a Christian or not, you're going to go through hardships, whether financial or illness or anything else. But how we allow God to be able to use those is what takes us deeper into him. 
And I think that that actually is symbolizes really well in the weight. And so, guys, I get this feeling that God's actually saying to us, listen, I've got so much in store for you and that you need to get in the water. Can I just say, when I'm geared up and ready to go and all this is on me, I weigh a ton. I feel huge, right? It's the most horrible feeling before you get in the water. You are like this. And because the weight's on your back, you have to lean forwards. You watch scuba divers out of the water. It's not pretty. But once you're in, once you're in, everything changes. You are weightless. You are surrounded. You are submerged. The beauty of everything that's going on is amazing. And I think this is one of the reasons why sometimes when we choose to back away from God, life feels hard. Because once you're booted and suited in God, you're not supposed to live in the world outside of him. You're called to be in the water. You're called to be fully in him. And so I think sometimes this analogy actually works quite well across the board. And I'd say this to you today, guys, God's got so much more in store. And this is supposed to be an adventure. And he is longing for you to know him more. And actually, as we do this and as we get in and as we allow him to be able to take us into newer depths with him, that actually we will bless not just our own lives, but those around us as well. So coming back to that wonderful analogy of the river with all of its wonder and what God wants to do, I think God is calling something amazing spiritually into being as within us as a church as something's going to happen in and around us as a church as the river of God flows from this place. But he's not calling you to stand at the side. He's saying, guys, get in and let's do this adventure together. So I hope, I, it's not quite the same as me wearing it all, but I think we would have spent half the sermon you watching and giggling as I was trying to put it all on. But I hope this will stick with you uh, as being something that's, that's worth remembering, uh, just that God's calling you deeper. God's calling us deeper. So this Christmas, my hope is that in the midst of all of your tinsel, in the midst of all of your glittering lights and the presents and all the other stuff, is this Christmas you might experience him in something new and wonderful that causes you to say, wow, God, you're amazing. That's my prayer for you That's as much as it is for me. Shall we pray together? And we're going to finish with a couple of songs that reflect some of the sentiments that we've sung, uh, that we've talked about and read as we do this together. Let's, let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for... Lord, this analogy, um, Lord, you're calling us deeper into you. Lord, to know you more, to experience you more, to trust you more. And Lord, as we, as we read through the, the, the book of the New Testament, we are just overwhelmed by just how these moments happen, these miracles happen. And if we're honest, we're looking and going, Lord, that, wouldn't that be amazing to see some of those things happen in our church life and in, in our personal life? But Lord, that, that only happens when we choose to throw ourselves into you. And, and so, Lord, we just ask, God, would you wake us up, spiritually wake us up to who you are and the wonder of who you are, that we might know you more, Lord, that we might go deeper into the things of you. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know about you guys, but um, the thought of physically scuba diving scares me like you wouldn't believe, like they're never going to get me in there. But right now, all I want to do is dive as deep as I possibly can. So let's stand and sing together. Um, I'm going to start with All Who Are Thirsty. Oh, 
are thirsty All who are weak Come to the fountain Dip your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out to deep We sing, come Lord Jesus, come Dip your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out to deep We sing, come Your grace. 
place that binds in deepest waters, your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where fear may fail and fear surrounds me, you never failed and you won't start now. So I call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you will call me take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my savior spirit lead me where my trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you will call me take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my savior spirit lead my trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you will call me take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my savior i will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are mine Gosh, Heavenly Father, we just want to go deeper with you We want to know you more We want to see what you have in store for us, Lord lead the way, clothe us in everything we need to be more like you, be surrounded by you and just, yeah, let us embrace that as we go out into our week, whatever that may look like. We ask this in your name. Amen. That is officially the end of our service. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, guys. Um, We don't the coffee shop isn't open but we do have tea and coffee available um so help yourselves we'll keep it topped up and uh, yeah just enjoy being together Uh, just to remind you, sorry guys, we have actually forgotten to take our offering. The plate is at the uh, the back of church and uh, our details are on the screen. So if you would like to give and that's the way that works for you, please feel free. Thank you. <laughs> 